Madam Speaker designate, I'm going to call you Madam Speaker because you were a speaker already. And once you have that title, you keep it. And um, Senator, let me. I understand we had a bris because not only the mother is Jewish, but here's a story that uh, Chuck likes to tell. His daughter comes in and goes, um, so I met this guy and I think I'm gonna marry him. His name is Shappy. Your blood froze in your veins because Shappy didn't sound too Jewish. And then she says, dad, don't worry. His name is Shapiro. I said, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> so, as you both know, the IAC, the Israeli American Council, is an organization that amongst many other educational and civic goals is focused on strengthening the relationship between the US and Israel. So my questions today will be primarily, primarily, and most of the question, about this relationship. Madam Speaker, if I may, I'd like to start with you. <laughs> Under your renewed relationship in the House, with the addition of 62 new Democratic House members, how do you see this relationship going ahead? Do you think that the next Congress can sustain a bipartisan legislative agenda on the U.S.-Israel relationship, despite what we all see, unfortunately, the partisan divide that we see in Congress. Tell us what you have in mind in terms okay. of keeping it strong, this relationship. I appreciate that. Thank you, Haim, for the invitation to be here. I'm honored to be here with our uh, leader in the Senate. I join you in wishing him mazel tov on the birth of Noah Melvin, and uh, wish him happy Hanukkah, first night of Hanukkah. Um, four of my nine grandchildren will be lighting the candles tonight in their homes as well, so we, uh, we uh, share that uh, uh, beautiful value. And as I answer the question, though, I do want to first ad address your theme, the first part of it, Israel in heart. Chaim knows that uh, in my family, my father, uh, and I tell you this story because to answer your question, you have to, we know that we have shared very deep, shared values about the Israel-US relationship and how important it is to the, every American that we keep that as strong as possible. And that is the work of the Democrats and Republicans. It's very important for us to keep it bipartisan. But let me tell you about Israel in the heart. Um, when, I, when I was, my father was a member of Congress in the New Deal. He was a, worshiped at the altar of Franklin Roosevelt. And he, but he split with them, he split with him on two issues. One, he didn't think the Roosevelt administration was doing enough to help the Jews in Europe at the time and was demonstrating that, as well as the, for the establishment of a, a Jewish state in mandatory, what they call mandatory Palestine at the time. He joined something called the Bergsten Group. He, uh, he was a great orator. They had pageants and parades and rallies, and he spoke at all of those. Fortunately, when he was a young boy, he was a Shabbat Goy, so he spoke Yiddish, so he was really the star of the show, and he would go out there as an Italian-American Catholic speaking Yiddish and sharing this story. Uh, I'm so pleased that so much has been written about it in the Jerusalem Post, and this one uh, in the Jewish Times of Baltimore, his honor, and also just one in Hamodia this uh, past week called Congresswoman D'Alessandro's Daughter. And it was, uh, you can see those on democraticleader.gov. Because what it was is, it was just a commitment he had. And when he was in Congress, I was looking at the congressional record, uh, Chuck, and it said, 
he would rise on the floor and say, Mr. Speaker, I rise as a member of the Jewish men's army, and then go on and make his remarks about all of this. So we have Israel in the heart, in the DNA, and in the heart. A few years after that... So now, the heart, I, I apologize for interrupting you, the heart is great, but de facto in the field, there is a very big partisan divide. How do you think about the way going forward? Well, I think that, again, I think that what I talk about, it being in my DNA, I'm not quite finished because when Israel was established and I was a little girl and uh, Simon Soboloff, who was my father's solicitor in the city of Baltimore, now he became mayor, went there for that establishment of Israel, came back and told us as children about the establishment of the state of Israel. So again, it is part of who we are as Americans. I'm very pleased that our caucus has overwhelmingly been supportive of Israel without any question. If you hear of one person or another, it's not about anything other than their, perhaps their individual vote. I'm very pleased that 76% of, well, according to one study that I have seen, 70% of people in our country, Jewish people in our country voted Democratic in this election. So that is a very important point in terms of our connection. I have said to people when they ask me, if this capital crumbled to the ground, the one thing that would remain is our commitment to our aid, and I don't even call it aid, our cooperation with Israel. Because that's fundamental to who we, fundamental uh, to who we are. That's thank, why I'm so thank delighted you, to be here. So, uh, you're going to offer Paul, your husband, as the Goy of Shabbat, like your dad was? Well, we'll, we'll take it up with him. Uh, we'll okay, see. a new job for Paul. Senator, the polls indicate that the support for Israel is declining amongst the younger generation, and especially with the younger generation of Democrats. Why do you think that is, and what can you, as the leader in the Senate, do to address that issue? Well, thank you, Chaim. First, I want to let everyone know how much Chaim cares about the American-Israel relationship. There probably doesn't go a week that goes by without him calling me about one issue or another. Not for himself, but for everyone. And let me wish everyone a Chag Sameach. And I'll tell one little story, too. Chaim told a story, but some stories I can't tell in Peoria or Ogdensburg, New York. This is just a story of my roots. So I was redistricted in 1990 to a new district in Queens. And I'm campaigning in Forest Hills, Jewish neighborhood. And the lady comes over to me and says, oh, you're Congressman Schumer. I read in the Queens Tribune, you're going to be my new congressman. She said, you know, I've never met you in person, but I watch C-SPAN religiously, and I want to tell you something. You have more courage than any other member of Congress. I said, well, ma'am, that's a very uh, strong statement. What makes you say that? She says, well, I watch C-SPAN, and you're the only one of the 435, when you rise to your feet to speak, who has the courage to wear a yarmulke. I said, ma'am, it's obvious you haven't met me in person. It's not a yarmulke. <laughs> now, the serious question. There are two issues here. One, the Democrats, one, the young people. On the Democratic side, in the House and in the Senate, the support for Israel is virtually unanimous. And I'm going to just read you so you see a few of the things that just happened. Everyone, I want to... First, I want to thank Mr. and Mrs. Force for being here. Unanimous support of the Taylor Force Law. We're very close to unanimous. And we, Nancy and I, worked very hard to get it in the uh, last spending bill. Now, let me tell you another one. Uh, so many things that happened in the Senate. Every recall, member of the Senate Senator, caucus. Senator, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I recall calling you about this and you saying to me, I need you to tell me to support this. He called me all the time. And, um, but it's so right. And I'm going to get to its importance to the young people in a minute. 
but every member of the every single member of the Senate Democratic Caucus supports security to Israel, Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow 3, the Stop Human Shields Act, which mandates sanctions against Hamas and Hezbollah for using human shields, supported by the entire Democratic Caucus. All 100 senators signed a letter to the Secretary General of the UN about anti-Israel bias at the UN. All 100 senators signed a letter to Secretary Nielsen asking her to support Israel's participation in the Global Entry Program. This audience that matters to, right? Global Entry, you gotta travel a lot. And now we, are, we have the United States Israel Security Act, which would for years cement the military relationship. Every single Democrat uh, supports it. And in reference to what Nancy said, one person is holding it up right now, that's Senator Paul, he's a Republican. But I don't say the Republicans don't support Israel, just him. Almost everybody else does, the young people. This is our biggest problem. Uh, hold on a second, while you're at Rand Paul, why do you think that is? What's with Rand Paul all of a sudden? Rand Paul is, he marches to his own drum. And no one can quite, in all due respect, he's a very nice man, I see him in the gym, on the bike. But no one can quite figure out where he's coming from on some of these issues. Because if you believe in the security of America, you have to support the security of Israel. There's not a difference between the two. And so I don't believe it. But let me just say about the young people. Here's the problem we face. And it's not young people of just Democrats. I read a study that now a third of the evangelical Christian young people are less supportive of Israel. They don't know what Israel went through. They're young. So when I went to Madison High School, I was 16 years old, 17 years old. A Madison, Madison. You know, I was on the basketball team at Madison. You know what our motto was? We weren't good. We may be small, but we're slow. <laughs> but in any case, in any case, in June of 1967, when I was at Madison High School, I walked around the halls of the school with a transistor radio to my ear. Some of you young people, that was the first kind of radio that you didn't have to plug in. So young people don't know what that is. <laughs> anyway, why did I do that? Because I was afraid that there'd be no Israel. The 67 war had erupted, and every lover of Israel, Jew, non-Jew alike, thought Israel would be washed into the sea. And then the 73 war, and we went through, and the attacks, and the terrorism, and the Olympics, so those of us who are a little older have seen the intransigence of so many in the Arab world, not just to disagree with Israel, but to wipe Israel out off the face of the map. The trouble is the young people haven't seen that, Chaim. The young people have seen Israel as strong because through their lifetimes, that's what it is. And we have to show them that Israel still existence, it's only, you know, eight million people amidst a hundred million people. Its very existence is still precarious, despite what Israel has done to build up its strength. With Iran, you know, Iran has nuclear weapons. You know, there are so many different problems that Israel faces. And we have to make an effort, a strong effort, aimed at the young people, not so much in the traditional media, but online. And I would hope that the leaders, Democrat and Republican, of America, of the Jewish community, could come together and we could have a massive campaign aimed at the young people, showing them what we all know. And one other point, one of the reasons, not the only reason, I told this to Mr. and Mrs. Force. One of the reasons I thought the Taylor Force Law was so important is because it showed that even the so-called moderate Arab uh, country, Palestinians, the Palestinian Authority, is rewarding terrorism and giving aid to terrorists and making them heroes. Most young people don't know what a lot of the textbooks say about Israel, the Palestinian Authority textbooks say. So we need a campaign aimed particularly at the young, using the media they talk about, the language they talk about, to show them the truth. They don't know the truth. There's been a lot of propaganda the other way. 
So, so what you're really saying is this group of people here, all of us, and not only Congress, both houses, but all of us here have a duty to create a whole program to educate the mm. younger generation. They that's just right. don't know. And, and that's that what we're going to do, right? That's what we're going to do. We're going to educate mm. the young people about the facts. They just don't know the facts. And the facts are, once they know the facts, they will come under the tent. So I agree with you, it's an educational thing. Hi, um, uh, since Chuck was bragging about the Senate and what they're up to, I want to uh, revisit um, your other question about what we do in the House as we go forward with this new Congress. And I want you to take great pride in the fact that Debbie Wasserman Schultz, who was here in a bipartisan situation, is a what we call a cardinal, a Jewish cardinal in the Appropriations Committee. The cardinals are, uh, they are the chairs of the, of the committees. She has a very important position on appropriations, which is where this bill of funding for Israel takes place. Two people who are going to be here, Lois Frankel is on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Alcee Hastings on rules, but he's our, our top person, our chairman of the Helsinki. And that's important in terms of anti-Semitism as well as pro-Israel initiatives. Ted Deutsch from this area is the, is the chair of the Middle East Subcommittee of the Foreign Affairs Committee. The list goes on. Nita Lowy is the chair of the Appropriations Committee, the first woman and a big supporter of Israel, as you know, a strong Israel-U.S. relationship. Elliot Engel is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Adam Schiff is the chair of the Intelligence Committee. So we have people very well placed to share our values in terms of the heart and the, uh, the, the Israel in heart and Israeliness in spirit. Shared values, remove all doubt in your mind. It's just a question of not paying attention to a few people who may want to go their own way but as far as our Congress is concerned, we try very hard to unify, to have bipartisanship in all of this. Now, I don't know about Rand Paul. I don't go to the gym. So I think that <laughs> You are welcome to the gym, Madam Speaker. I don't even know where it is. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Can I just, Chaim, one thing? If you probably look in the House of Representatives, the two most important committees for Israel are foreign affairs and appropriations. And you couldn't have two stronger supporters of Israel, both New Yorkers, than Nita Lowy and Elliot Engel. So the House is in very good shape to be really strong for Israel this year. Well, and for that, thank you, Taking Nancy. Taking credit for New York, okay. I was saying it for that, thank you, Nancy. So the administration is going to eventually release their peace plan. And there's going to be quite a few things you agree with and quite a few things you maybe not completely agree with. How do you see this cooperation on the peace plan, assuming it's released, and assuming that both Israel and the Palestinian Authority will agree to come to the table to negotiate. What role can Congress play here in order to help move that plan forward? Well, first of all, it would be interesting to see the plan. I took a Codell to Israel in uh, March, the end of March, right around the time of, of Passover. And we thought that it was imminent then, and Elliot Engel was on the trip, a whole, the, but it, it, we didn't see anything, we haven't seen it yet. But I, I would say that the principles that we have a hope to see there is a two-state solution, which we have always been saying we're for. I know there's controversy, but the other, the extreme left on this is asking for a one-state solution. So understand we have to strike the balance. But anyway, we want a solution. And as I've said to Prime Minister Netanyahu, the word two-state 
solution. It's not a solution. If it's not a solution, then two-state doesn't mean anything, right? Focus on the word solution. Just focus on the word solution. And in addition to that, we have to, I think, in Congress, make it really clear to the Palestinians that we expect them to be responsible negotiators, and we haven't seen a lot of that thus far. And we have to say to our friends in the Arab world, you can weigh in on this in a way that makes them responsible negotiators. Because we really want to see, again, Israel to prevail as a Jewish democratic uh, state. But we have to make sure that there is security, because that is the first responsibility of any government. It's the oath we take as members of Congress and any of you who are part of any uh, official organization to protect and defend. And we have to make sure that the security of Israel is essential, that is essential to a solution. So don't separate anything from the word solution. Sounds like a good plan. Security. Well, we want to see it. We want to see the plan though. Do no, you no, your plan. Their plan, we don't know. Your plan to make sure that the security of Israel is guaranteed under any so-called solution. The greatest right, right huh? The greatest way, yes, sir. The two points here. The greatest way that we can make sure that the uh, other side comes to the table is if they know they cannot break the relationship between the U.S. and Israel. That's why this group is so important. That's why staying what leader, what Speaker Pelosi said, is so important. If they know we're going to stick by Israel security-wise and in every other way through thick and thin, they're more likely to come to the table. Now, it's not our job to impose a solution. That's going to have to be worked out between the uh, parties. We can try to get them to the table, but we should make it clear when they get to the table, you're not going to break the strong bond between Israel and the United States of America. That's the most likely way to get peace. Let, let me just say uh, this other thing talk about my family again. I believe that the establishment of the State of Israel was the greatest political accomplishment of the 20th century. The, uh, it was a, a bad century, as we know, in many respects. But here was this beacon of hope, of values just a fabulous thing. One of the prizes that I have is a picture of my father when he was mayor with Prime Minister Golda Meir when he welcomed her to Baltimore. This, this beacon of hope, this wonderful accomplishment, and we cannot in any way have that diminished because it's not just about a country, it's about a val values. It's an idea, it is a phenomenon, and it is our close, close friend. So again, this is, I think we all have a shared interest in a peace plan not weakening Israel's security. That's absolutely for sure. They shouldn't even be engaged in a negotiation that would do that, in my view. But I do think that uh, when we talk about these young people and how they receive information, um, we have to make sure they understand this is not an issue. This is not a provision, this is not a subject, this is a value, this is an ethic, this is part of who we are. Yeah, I think this audience seems to agree with you both, right? That's a good thing. Um, I mean, there's no question that the relationship is vital for Israel, but it is also very important to the United States. We shouldn't forget that this is a two-way street. This is not a one-way street. There's much that Israel does for the United States also. I am, and yes. I say this as an Israeli-American very proudly. And part of the education is to make those that don't know these facts what Israel does for the United States, and it's a lot. You're so right, Chaim. What is the greatest threat to America right now? 
externally terrorism. Which country probably does more other than our country ourselves to fight terrorism and help America fight terrorism with shared intelligence, with making, keeping an eye on what these terrorists are doing in terms of, you know, military cooperation that is like this. No other country does more to protect America from terrorism, other than our country ourselves, than Israel. And that's a point that people have to be, have to um, be made known. You're 100% right, Chaim. And much, and much of it is unknown. Much. Except for sometimes it's shared with the Russians, but that's another conversation for another day. Okay. No, but you have to recognize the uh, intellectual resource Israel is to us. You know, we talk about our mutual uh, yeah. security and the rest, and we talk about fighting terrorism. Uh, but some of the uh, technological advances which are so important really uh, are springing from Israel. And uh, well, the sec uh, Prime Minister likes to brag about how many, in another category, not uh, security, but in technology about how many uh, companies there are engaged in technology for driverless cars. I mean, Israel is on the forefront of technology, and technology holds the key to so much in terms of, of uh, uh, security as well. And in terms of, if we're going to talk about anti-Semitism, I, I want yeah, to talk but about But the leader, Nance, I mean, one-third of all of the defense against cybersecurity that the U.S. uses is done in Israel. One third. And here's another example. So we had the Arrow system, which was an anti-missile defense system. We shared it with Israel. And Israel, with Iron Dome, perfected it even further. And the way that Israel perfected it is now being used in America to protect ourselves as well. So there are so many examples that the cooperation benefits uh, the U.S. And I think that for this audience and everybody that is willing to be called to the flag to educate those that are not familiar with all these facts. What Israel does for the United States needs to be highlighted as part of that education. And people will realize that this is indeed a two-way street. Okay, so uh, we touched on anti-Semitism. Um, you know, the latest polls are very worrisome, obviously. Um, there are different bills that deal with issues of anti-Semitism. Uh, a question to both of you, what do you guys think you can do to address that issue of uh, this ugly phenomenon raising its head? Well, the best lesson that we have learned through the centuries is when anti-Semitism rears its ugly head, wherever and however, it must be rebutted strongly and immediately. We need the Jewish community to do that, but we also need the non-Jewish community to do that as well. The, this poison, when exposed to sunlight, can go away. But if it's allowed to fester, and we have an attitude, oh, we don't have to worry about it, or oh, those people are crazy, and we don't, you know, they're way out of the mainstream, it'll grow. So the b most important thing to do is to speak out against it. The second is we have now passed laws. I was one of the authors of the Hate Crimes Act. And the Hate Crimes Act should be used to go after anti-Semites. We do have laws on the books. And when they go beyond speech, putting swastikas on places, uh, harassing Jews, doing other kinds of things, we have laws to go after them, and we should. And again. This, this is a little bit, um, well, let me go. I, I had another point I wanted to make about how Israel is also a refuge against anti-Semitism, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you make your point first. Okay, I, I, as a, I was speaker, when we passed the hate crimes bill, and it's really very important, but there are other things to enforce it and to shine a bright light on anti-Semitism as it rears our, its head in our country. And one of, the, one of the things that we can do is which we we intend to do in the majority is that we have uh, put a spotlight on uh, domestic terrorism in our country. I believe the Tree of Life uh, horror was 
an act of domestic terrorism. That was a terrible, terrible thing in our country. And we have to make sure that anybody who entertains thoughts like that knows that there's a bright light shining there. We have to, we have to do that. But then in terms of anti-Semitism, well, look, I have two of my grandchildren went to part of school in Arizona when some incidences came up and where they're going to have to have more security and this or that. Another went to Jewish Community Center in San Francisco. Little children, uh, be, uh, families with little children being concerned about uh, the uncertainty of all of that. It has no place, it has no place in our country, but it has no place in the world. And so when we send, like as I send, Alcee Hastings to be the chair from our standpoint of the Helsinki Commission to make anti-Semitism in Europe all over a primary issue, and that is his charge. When Lewis Frankel goes to the North, the NATO par interparliamentary group, that this is an issue that we take up with the Europeans because, as you know, we have some issues there with them, what is going on. Oh, when, uh, Brad Schneider from Illinois, I sent him to, to go to those regular meetings to make sure that they know that as we have discussions about any issue, we have to recognize our fundamental commitment that this is, this is uh, uh, part and parcel of any discussion we can have about any issue if these countries are allowing in their parliaments or in their communities anti-Semitism uh, to fester. But it is, uh, it is something that is out there. We have to recognize it. We have to deal with it. But it, it is, uh, as, as Chuck said, it's, it's about issues other than anti-Semitism. There's just some a climate now that uh, is against everything, against, against any uh, definition of someone. But the anti-Semitism part of it is easily identifiable, and we have to make sure uh, that we are making that people understand this has no place in our country. And I, I, I think we all have to work together on that there because there's some people who are kind of looking the other way with some of the anti-Semitism that is very visible in some public places Kaim, in our life. One more point, not here in our country, but the poison of Europe for millennia has been anti-Semitism. It's just somehow it always rears its ugly head. And the, the other thing we should all be doing as citizens, as elected officials, as uh, uh, leaders, is speaking out against European anti-Semitism because it is truly, you go to different parts of Europe, even places like France and Spain, and Jewish people are afraid to live there, which is a new phenomenon in the last 10 or 15 years. So we can't forget it overseas, because when it grows in one place, it spreads to another. I, I said I'm not going to do this, but I'm going to do it. And there are no nice people on both sides. There are bad people, and there are good people. And the bad people are the anti-Semites, period. There are no nice people over there. So. In closing, a question for you both. You, you want to stay more? Well, we can stay more. It says two minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, I have one more. In conclusion, all right. yeah? Can I ask a last question? Sure. <laughs> Go right ahead, Chaim. You want to be the moderator? <laughs> I moderate enough. You do it. People keep taking my job away from me. So. A question for you both. Alexander Haig, the former Secretary of State, famously stated, Israel is the largest American aircraft carrier in the world that cannot be sunk, does not carry even one American soldier, and is located in a critical region for American national security. Apologies for putting you on the spot. How would you, in one sentence, define that relationship? One sentence. Without well, you can take two sentences, OK. <laughs> uh, really, re revisiting some of what uh, Chuck said earlier, uh, it, is an, it is in our national security interest 
it is in the national security interest of the United States of America for us to support, to have a strong relationship, a U.S.-Israel relationship. It's just, it's about security, it's about values, it's about, again, this beacon of hope that is a message to the world about respect for people, but again, recognizing our first responsibility is to keep them safe. And that means safe in the United States of America in terms of fighting anti-Semitism. That's, it's a big thing. And the example that we set in the United States about that subject should be an example to the world. So, and I agree with Nancy. It's an aircraft carrier in two ways. One, in terms of military strength, which we talked about. Israel does more to help America against terrorism than any other place. The fact that there's a democracy in Israel that is there in the Middle East, that is a firm and committed ally of the United States, helps us throughout the whole region far more. It's, 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 Israel does the job so that American soldiers and American troops don't have to be there to protect us, and we should never forget that. But it also, uh, it also, it's, a, it's an aircraft carrier in terms of values and freedom. It's the only, demo Israel's the only democracy in the Middle East. It sets an example. It holds the others to shame who persecute people, who execute people, who arrest journalists and everything like that. And that's a value too, and I'll conclude on this little note. So my um, grandfather came to America in 1892. He was the youngest of 18 children. My great-grandfather was a very religious rabbi, and he believed in the first commandment of God to man in the Bible, Peru or Vu, be fruitful and multiply. So he had 18 kids with one wife. My grandfather came over here, and here I am. But when the Nazis came into Ukraine in 1941, they told his mother, my grandfather's mother, who was then the matriarch of the family, gather your whole family on the porch. And 32 people went to that porch, people from 80 years old to two years old. And the Nazis said, you come with us. She said, we're not moving. They machine gunned all 32 of them down in cold blood. I would like to be able to tell my, my I would have liked my great-great-grandmother, but my children and my new grandson will see that that great aircraft craft carrier of military might but of freedom and of refuge is now here and will be here forever. That's what I'd like to tell you. something to say. Thank you, Chuck, for that, sharing that beautiful story with us. And it reminds me that as I've gone around the country and some places in the Midwest where, as you say, um, we have more persuasion and, and sometimes very strong support there, people say to me in the Jewish community, you can't possibly understand you don't have Jewish grandparents. To which I say, no, but I have Jewish grandchildren. And as Chuck said, this is about Noah Melvin and, and the, the life of, that he will lead. I will just close by thanking you for being such an intellectual resource to be a fair uh, understanding what our, the challenges are and, and hoping that we can do the, our boldest common denominator in all this. But I'll say this, this is a glorious undertaking that we're in. We can talk about some of the uh, unfortunate incidences, but let us make this a joyous, a joyous reach to young people, that they will be part of sharing values that are fundamental to our country, fundamental to us in our relationship with Israel. Let's have, let's, let's enjoy, I'm having a good time today, I hope you are too, but let's make this something that takes them to a place that they will be leaders and they will be proud and they will be knowledgeable and they'll have a vision that we share that can take us to heights as we look back on it that 
said, remember there was a time when they had all of these wars. Let's put that in the museum. Let's take us into the future in a very bright way. And that is that beacon of Israel making it bright. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Mr. Leader. Uh, for those of us who knew, thank you for reconfirming what we knew. Uh, for those of us who didn't know, thank you for clarifying that the support for Israel with the, the, the Democratic Party is here, strong, and will be forever. And bipartisan. Let me just say one more thing. Bipartisan. Um, you're going to have the last word because we want to make this all bipartisan. But um, my first trip to Israel, my husband and I went with Iris and Chuck. How many years ago is that? Like 29? 19, a, nine, nine, about 30 years ago. About 30 years ago. So we have been working together on this issue for a very, very long time. I took them everywhere except when they did the Stations of the Cross, I stayed home. <laughs> Thank you both very much. My heart is in Israel, my patriotism is in the United States. Israel means to me my homeland and the place I was born, the place I love. Israel is me. The values that he left to me, honesty and philanthropy, I live by those values. As the state of Israel goes, as the citizens, the Jews of the state of Israel go, so go the Jews of the diaspora. It's very important to preserve Judaism, to make Israel stronger. The United States is proud to recognize Dr. Allison. When brothers and sisters are together in unity, that is Sheldon's miracle. When I saw the IAC, it was the first time that I saw so many Israeli Americans in one place at one time. This amazing. I saw how much they really care about Israel. And I was very impressed with them. In the middle of the event, when we felt all the energy, Sheldon turned to me and said, That organization could build itself by bringing all the Israeli Americans together. We can copy it all over America and have a movement. They are among the world leading philanthropies. And the rest is uh, history. The Allison family, ladies and gentlemen. Mary and I are so passionate about the IAC. The merging of the Israeli-American community with American Jews is very gratifying and very heartwarming to me. And more connecting with the Israeli community. And it's building up. We're almost at 20 branches, and we may end up with more. I feel part of the local community. We have programs like Keshet. Our grandson is... We're getting kids at a young age. That's the ideal time to get them. Matan was in Eitanim, and he was the counselor in the Israeli scouts. In the IAC Eitanim program. And they must vomit for the safety of the state of Israel. My granddaughter is now in Garin Tzabar in Israel. We want our children to carry out our values. Children and me are going to donate to the national IAC $13 million. You never stop inspiring us that $63 million to the IAC in only six years. That's amazing. Completely unequivocal. There's no question about their love for Israel. We are important. We are the second line of 